Hello and welcome to Senior Solutions, where we discuss topics impacting seniors and their families. I'm your host, Mindy Fellenton. I'm joined today by Carol Whitney, who is a parish nurse, and she's here to tell us what a parish nurse does and how they help seniors and their families. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here, Carol. Thank you for having me. Tell us, uh, if you would, because I think probably a lot of people in the audience have no idea what a parish nurse does. Well, I'll, I'll tell you first a little bit about parish nursing, um, and I will sometimes use the term faith community nursing, or I will say parish nursing, and they're the same thing. Okay. Parish nursing started in the 1980s in uh, the Midwest. A gentleman, a pastor named Granger Westberg, saw a need, for, and he was serving hospitals in Chicago, and he saw a need for more care in some rural areas, and he thought that care needed to be more than just for the physical but for the emotional and spiritual as well and he provided training for um, nurses to go from the hospital into communities in the more rural areas and they set up shops so to speak in churches and um, not only worked with people in blood pressure problems and things like that but also um, holistically in terms of body mind and spirit since that time parish nursing has grown to be an international form of it, form of nursing, but um, it has changed a little bit. Now parish nursing is usually, uh, the nurses who are called parish nurses uh, come from churches. And the reason it's been changed also to faith community nursing is while it started out as a, in Christian churches, it is really available for any faith group, be it Jewish or Muslim or anything else. So we are using many times now the more general term of faith community nurses. But most of us serve in a church or another form of a religious institution. And we work with the folks who are in our congregation. Um, uh, we have specialized training. Uh, we are all registered nurses, licensed registered nurses, first of all. Um, and then we take some specialty training. In, what would that be? In parish nursing. It's, it's at, it, when we take the specialty training, it is not any more about how to be a nurse in terms of what you do the medical to be a nurse. Part. Right. Mm -hmm. But it is it uh, calls us to become more involved in our own spiritual selves so that some of the training is theological, spiritual formation and things like that and then nitty gritties of how to serve in a church because it's a totally different thing than serving in another institution such as a hospital or a nursing home. Um, you are usually most faith community nurses are part of the congregation. That's what I started over 20 years ago when I became a faith community nurse at my church, and I'm still there. Um, so the, the situations we deal with are very different. We are not out there giving care. We are not home care nurses that people think of that after they've been in the hospital, sometimes home care nurses are assigned to come and evaluate them and continue with teaching and treatment. But we um, are instead nurses who see them as whole people that we get to know them because they are part of the congregation and when they are going through difficult times we work with them. One of the things I frequently, one way I frequently refer to myself and other faith community nurses is we are navigators. We help folks navigate through the health care system. Um, as you know and, and many people know the health care system has gotten more complex. Uh, we, many people have many, each person has many doctors Sometimes the, when they go into a hospital, their own doctor doesn't treat them anymore. They are treated by hospitalists or other specialists in the hospital. And um, they can feel pretty lost. Mm -hmm. And all of our health care is focused on the physical med medical model. Parish nursing, we are more looking at the whole person model. Can you give me an example kind of from start to finish of somebody you would work with Okay. and how you would help them. Kind of take me through that process. Yes. I think that would be really helpful to have a better grasp okay. on what, what you would do. Yes, I can. Um, I will give you one that happened recently. It's a fairly quick one, and later maybe I can give a more in-depth um, example of something. But um, at our church, we had someone there for a luncheon, and I, was, I, happened, I don't spend all my time at the church, obviously. I'm out visiting folks, but that day I happened to be there, and someone came to get me and said that she had fallen and was having trouble getting up. So I went to her, assessed her rather quickly. She was an elderly woman, and it appeared to me that she'd probably broken her hip. 
So we called 911 to have her transported to the hospital and helped contact her family. Uh, she had driven to the church. She was I, very I hate to interrupt yes. you, but it's just at the tip of my tongue, the commercial. She's fallen and she can't get up, but she didn't have that call. Right. <laughs> she didn't, but that was because she was at church. There were plenty of people okay. around. That's for someone who is at home. And right, right I recommend that for people. She actually didn't live alone. She lived with her husband. She had driven to church for that luncheon that day, was planning to drive home. Um, but she wanted, she had to go to the hospital, obviously. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did after calling 911 was to reach her family members. And her daughter was able to go and meet her at the hospital. And I also went to the hospital, to the emergency room, where it was determined that she did have a broken hip. She had to be admitted. She had surgery. And this was making a sudden change in their family, obviously, because um, she would not be able to go home for a while. Um, and so I, I was able to, before some of the steps happened, I was able to prepare the daughter, for instance, an adult daughter, for what would be happening. I said, you know, I, I heard what the doctor said. She heard what the doctor said. Her stress level was very high. Sure. Plus, she didn't totally understand it. The doctor was very nice. He explained things, but still, her background was not in anything medical. Right. So, so a different I, language. Right. So I com continued to explain it and say that she would, after she had the surgery, that she would be in the hospital for a few more days. Then she would probably go to a rehab facility, and she would be there for maybe a couple of weeks, and then she would be able to go back home. So uh, the reason I wanted to prepare her for that is I know from experience that when you're in the hospital for something like that, you will be brought a two-page list of all the rehab facilities in Montgomery County, for instance, because that's where she lived. And here's the list. Choose which one you would like. Actually, mention three so we, our social worker will contact them and plan the discharge. And this person has never dealt with any of these rehab facilities, doesn't know where they are, doesn't know what they're like. So as an experienced person in the community, I do, and I'm able to give her some guidance that this would be easier for you to get to, especially for the person's husband, because he can drive but doesn't want to drive all the way across the county. So she was able to give a more educated list of which ones she would prefer. And indeed, all these things happened. She had her surgery. Three days later, it was time to go up from the hospital, but she'd already selected the place, so she was transferred there. And again, I was just able to give them some preparation for that. And this all worked very well. She rehabbed very well. She's back home. She's back at church. Things are going fine. But it was uh, the fact that she didn't have to deal. It was stress enough that this accident had happened mm -hmm. and required emergency surgery. But I was able to alleviate some of that by preparing her and the family for what was going on. So you really have a, a social work, a very strong social work component to what you're doing. There is some of that, but it's I, I f tend to think of it more as faith-based because I knew this family. I didn't have to wonder who was. In fact, I we actually I actually said, "Do you want me to call your husband?" She said, "I'd rather you call my daughter first because she was afraid her husband would would get too upset." And so we were able to call her daughter. I knew this whole family. Um, because they'd been part of the church I'd been in. And I knew, and I could fully understand knowing them that her husband would be too upset and it would be too scary to have him immediately drive to meet at the hospital. So, um, so things like that are, are part of the parish nurse role that, that a, a person who just comes into your life at the time something happens doesn't have that kind of background and knowledge. So there's some social work, but it's also some spiritual that I, I know the family. Mm -hmm. I know what they've been through before. I even know that, you know, this person's sister had been involved in, in a nursing home many years ago, and so they had some experience that way, but things had changed, you know, and maybe maybe they would go in a different direction this time. So it's, um, it's, it's a, it, I call it whole body, whole mm -hmm. person, body, mind, and spirit, right? So you would only be, in fact, um, acting as a parish nurse for the parishioners who go to the church for which you're... Where I'm a member, at. yes, um, or where I'm serving. For the most part, but I do get involved in other situations. Um, a, a person who goes to the church, um, we have, a, we have a, a prayer shawl ministry at our church 
where some members get together and make prayer shawls and with special uh, prayers, not necessarily the entire time they're making it, but they're thinking about the person who's going to receive it. And one of the, a couple of the people in that ministry are not members of our church, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told by the person who is a member of our church that this non-member husband had just been diagnosed with cancer. And I knew this woman a little bit from being in the ministry, the prayer shawl ministry. And so I was able to begin to get involved with that family. Um, again, at the first time in the hospital to try to prepare them for some of the things that might be going on. I was there when a doctor talked to them and they were, this was a sudden diagnosis. Um, their reaction was to sit there with their mouths hanging open. Mm -hmm. They heard everything, but perhaps didn't understand even enough to ask their own questions because they're too stunned. So here was a person that I also was able to help and I continued to help them for several months after that. Um, so it's not as if um, I can't help other people, you know, but, but my focus, I am, it is a part-time position in the church and paid for from the church. Um, I'm a part of the, actually considered part of the pastoral staff. My immediate supervisor would be the pastor of the senior pastor of the church. Um, but I am uh, there for that. We work very closely together um, on coordinating when we're going to visit. Um, he lets me know if he's visited somebody that is experiencing some, perhaps some medical issues that he is not uh, able to, to help them with. And on the other hand, I notify him whenever I'm visiting someone and find that they have a, they would like to receive communion at a special time or someone is coming into the family from out of town and they would like to have a special time to talk with a pastor. So we work a lot together. Most of the visits I make when I, I visit many of our shut-ins um, and besides working with what is going on in their life of what's going on with their illness, um, I usually have a time to pray with them. And so that's some of the training we get. Mm -hmm. is, is, and to be comfortable with that. And before we can be comfortable with it, we have to be comfortable with it in our own lives. And that's some of the training we get in a parish nurse course. Um, Which is where we... Where we kind of started, <laughs> right? I'm sorry. No, no. So, I, so I these, was the one who asked right, you. These courses range anything, uh, anywhere from, they, are get, they can be given by, at hospital programs, they can be given by church programs, they, some of them are given in colleges and universities, and they can be anywhere from a 35-hour total um, certificate program to get, get, actually getting college credit or um, even graduate credit, depending on the place that's giving the, the training. So, but um, in order to call yourself a parish nurse, you have to have at least that 35 hours of training. So, so you've really gone through a, a vigorous training. Program right, I've actually us. been blessed over the past, I've been doing this for 20 years at, at my church. Um, my church family has been very supportive of it. And um, I received my original training at Wesley Seminary when they, they were graduate level courses, both in how to do parish nursing and also theological and spiritual formation courses. And then I was also fortunate to be able to take one advanced course at um, the Ecumenical Institute of, in Baltimore, at part of St. Mary's University, where um, we focused on doing specific projects. And, and that was part of the, the, what we did, research and then a project that would encompass the idea of parish nursing being body, mind, and spirit in our own congregation. So Great. Right. Well, when we, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, what I'd like to do is have you share with us some more experiences in working with some of your That's fine. families. So we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. loss, it's one of the many ways to fight osteoarthritis pain. For more information on managing pain, go to fightarthritispain.org. Welcome back to Senior Solutions, where we discuss topics impacting seniors and their families. I'm your host, Mindy Fellenton, and I'm joined today by Carol Whitney, who is a parish nurse. And we left off where Carol was talking with us about what a parish nurse does and giving us some examples of 
uh, situations where she's worked with families and also some of the training. What I'd like to do, Carol, is uh, have you share with me an experience where you have helped a family, where there may be some interesting family dynamics. I know I deal with people coming into my office all the time where there are family dynamics that we have to deal with. So I can only imagine that you do as well. Yes, um, certainly uh, churches are like all other organizations and we have all sorts of people and all sorts of family dynamics. And some of them are more difficult than others. Um, but I, I know that sometimes we're working with folks who, an, an elderly person, for instance, who has lived in this area most of their life, life and doing fine and independent, but there comes a time when, and they've raised children, but the children have all scattered to different parts of the country. So that when something happens to mom or grandma in this area, there is no family around. Um, and I have helped people with dealing with that. Uh, sometimes having to notify out-of-town family. Sometimes those things can be difficult because in some of these cases, some members of the out-of-town family have been less involved with the person over the years, mm -hmm. um, but are now wanting to get more involved and may not even know the person as well anymore as I do or as, a, as one other family member might. So that um, it can be very difficult because now it, an elderly person is ill, the children come in from out of town, and they're all in different places, mentally and so on, about what should be done for mom. Mm -hmm. And so those, those can be kind of difficult, and that requires one of uh, the skills that we have to work on all the time, which is listening. And listening to what they have to say. Uh, we can't solve their problems. Um, the problems that may have been part of the family for years and years do not go away when one member is sick. Um, we would like to think that everything could be solved, but it, it doesn't. It usually is ex exacerbated. That's I want to ask you oh, something, if I may, relative to that. In those situations where you're dealing with the, mm -hmm. the, the family dynamics mm -hmm. in that kind of a scenario, do you ever refer them out to anyone to try to help them deal with those underlying issues? Uh, depending on the timing of the situation, yes. Um, if there is, a, looks like there could be a, a need for some counseling, especially for the local people, you know, because I have contacts here. Um, that is a possibility. Unfortunately, most of the situations that come up be, are critical, not critical as in immediately having to have, perhaps have somebody make end of life decisions, but it's an emergency you know, a fall or a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. Um, so it's not really possible to get all of the out-of-town people involved in that sort of thing. If mm -hmm. things calm down, maybe there would be some time for that later. That's why it's interesting you bring that up because I, I mentioned before that I consider what I do being a navigator. Mm -hmm. A navigator does not fly the airplane, but a navigator figures how to get from point A to point B or possibly point A to point B by going around through point C. Um, but the ultimate decision is left up to the pilot. In this case, it may be the family member or the person themselves. So I open up options to them. I explain, OK, if you go down this road, you might see this happening. However, if you go down that road, which is the one that the individual themselves is kind of looking at and has told me in the past this is what they want to do, um, then you can help guide them that way. But the ultimate decisions are up to the individual and the family members. Um, that's why I like the term navigator, that yeah, you have the skills to get them, to teach them and show them and, and guide them, but they have to make the ultimate decisions. Mm -hmm. So going back to your scenario where you have the, the dynamics of the child who perhaps or children who are not necessarily hands-on with mm -hmm. mom, and now they're called in because, oh my, something may be happening right. to mom. Right. Could you? Well, and th those kinds of things. One particular one I know um, worked out that the the in, the mom um, was able to make her decisions for a long time, and she always said to me, I knew her for years. She always said to me that when she reaches the point of really not being able to take care of herself, she would move back 
to the place where one specific of the adult children was. Mm -hmm. And she was literally told me she was depending on me to help with that decision. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> lucky me, right. <laughs> being a navigator but not the pilot. <laughs> um, and I watched her go from living totally independently in her own home to living in a, in a senior retirement place, in an independent place, mm -hmm. but then having some medical and surgical crises and issues and problems that required her to have more and more help. And I had obviously gotten to know her very well. I'd known her when she had no problems that she needed me for, but we knew each other from church. And so there came a time when I had to say, I think this is the time you need to think about making that move. And just because she had said that to me before, it gave me permission to do that, but it wasn't easy for either one of us. Mm -hmm. um, but she, she was able then to talk to her family that she had made that decision, and they were... Um, there were still some degrees of, oh, mom, get, you wouldn't believe the things that mom's gotten over in the years, you know, how can you be sure? I said, well, no one can be sure. And there was a tendency to want to just hear what the doctor said, and the doctor would just give out the, the um, medical information. They would give out lab reports and x-rays and this. But a nurse is more, um, and a parish nurse especially, is more geared into how, does, how is a person living now? How are all these medical things impacting how a person lives, how they can take care of themselves, how they can eat, how the fact that she is losing weight is not an issue that she just has gotten ornery and doesn't, doesn't like the food anymore. It is part of her whole process of losing her appetite. And it's not a question of force feeding her or making her have Ensure and some of those things. Um, she doesn't want to do those things. And we had conversed about these things over the years in sort of a theoretical way, mm -hmm. but I became her kind of advocate at this point. And it did work out. She did move uh, back with her family until she died. And um, not with her family, but in a facility near her family. She, no longer, she didn't want to have to be in an assisted living or a nursing home where there was no family around. Mm -hmm. She felt that at that point she needed to be near family. And it did work out. But it was a, a process, and um, it partly was important that I had known her for many years. We'd been able to communicate. I, I didn't just come into her life at one of the crises. Right. We knew each other um, from many, many fun experiences, too. So, so you had that relationship with her right. that was exactly. allowing you to right. be able to carry out what right. her wishes were. Had she formalized that in any way? Yes, she had all the paperwork, but, you know, it's... She didn't have a, she, she never had, for instance, a massive stroke that made her vegetative or her brain no longer worked. It was a lot of uh, chronic things that were getting worse that, that was going on. And so that there needed to be some almost interpretation of what was going on. She didn't fit those exact lines that we have on our advanced directives, for instance. Um, but it's the talking about it and, and her seeing someone else go through something and then turning to me and say, don't you love it, ever let that happen to me. <laughs> you know, you be sure to tell my family. I wouldn't want that. She had it in writing, but she saw me more than she did her family, mm -hmm. even though they had legal um, authority. authority. Do you ever recommend to people that they do make sure that they have those things put in writing? Yes. In fact, one of the things we do as parish nurses is we have education programs within the church. And again, those are open to people outside. And one of the things I've done several times is have classes or little seminars on end-of-life care planning. Um, so we have done that. But, you know, I've had, when I've publicized that, I've had church folks come to me and say, oh, I don't want to go to that. It's so depressing. But we'll have some people and we'll have a class. And then, um, but that same person who said it was depressing, when something goes on with mom or wh however it works out in their family, who do they call first? But Carol, what are they talking about? Now they want to talk about a tube feeding. You know, what, and, and those now you're discussing it in a, in a more crisis time. Mm -hmm. So um, while we do some edu you know, formalized education things about nutrition, about uh, end of life, and about other you know, blood pressure management, um, things like when the Medicare Part D first came out, we had some class on that. And, um, but then people need the individualized um, when it happens to them, even though they've been to a class or they said they didn't need it. 
they have their own times that they need it. So. Yeah, sometimes I think it's unfortunate that it takes those crises right. to wake people up. Right, exactly. Or seeing somebody else go through it. Right. But I think right. an important component of what you talked about with your the woman with whom you were working mm -hmm. is making people aware of what your wishes are right. in addition to have it in writing. You exactly. Know, I, when I'm working with my clients who, for whom we're doing estate planning and we're working particularly with regard to the me medical component mm -hmm. of it, I always tell them, the client, to make sure that you have it in writing but that you also share what your sentiments are right. because... We, it's limited what right. we can put in black right. and white. Well, I, know, I can think of another lady who, um, she and her daughter who both live in this area, and she only had the one child, and um, the, her daughter proudly said, yes, and I've had mom fill out all that paperwork, and it's in the safe deposit box. Yeah. Perfect. And, right. And I thought, yeah, well, you know, let's get it out and read it occasionally because now something is going on that may lead to this becoming a close, because it, in my experience, most need most times that people need this paperwork and understanding what it is are not the great uh, traumatic injuries or illnesses that turn them into a vegetable that's a minor part of what happens to people most of it is what I call the dwindles that people go through and have you know as they age things aren't going quite as well and and things are much more gradual and so you you need to I can remember one person who's um, husband had actually been on renal dialysis for a while and it was coming to that point of now he couldn't really make a decision but maybe it was time to stop the dialysis and he and she was having a tough time she said I feel like I'm doing this to him and I said well let's look at what he wrote in his advanced directives mm -hmm. that he didn't want heroic things if he couldn't get any better and I think we're at that point. L remember what the doctor said. Mm -hmm. So that that's, that's kind of the important way that um, it happens rather than these big dramatic um, events in someone's life. It's right. much more gradual. We're going to start to wrap up, but what I'd like to do is um, ask you, in, in your many years of being a parish nurse, what do you find most rewarding? Well, there, there's a lot, but I think it's the sense that as people have gone through a crisis, and perhaps this has even led to a death, um, that, that it went the best possible way for them. It may not have been everything I wanted or everything I would have said, but they had the information, they were able to work together as a family, and the outcome was the best possible thing for all involved. And I think that sense of satisfaction, as a, as a nurse and faith community nurse, um, cure of someone is not the answer all the time. So I think that seeing how people can um, easily, not easily, but um, peacefully make these decisions and feel good about them, is, that's what is important to me. Oh, wonderful. If somebody wants to get in touch with you, Carol, how can they get in touch with you? Um, I'm a faith community nurse at Hughes United Methodist Church, and that's in Wheaton, Maryland. Uh, we have a website you can go to, um, and my email is on that website. Uh, the, I'll tell you the phone number right now. It's 301-949-8383, and that's at uh, Hughes United Methodist Church. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And if you have any topic ideas or want to get in touch with me, please feel free free to email me at seniorsolutionstv at gmail.com and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.